He's one of the best in the business. Uh, I always say he's the smartest guy in the room. And look, that's saying a lot because I always think I'm the smartest guy in the room. It's Spencer Tillman, college football analyst for Fox. Spencer T., what's up, my friend? Patrick, I'm doing well. Don't mean to brag, but I'm hanging in there, my man, and doing quite well. well and, uh, you are as well. It's good to be in your company. Hey, that's what we're that's what we're here for. And, and as like we always say, in any day that we can survive Tim Brando is a day we consider good. <laughs> uh, so. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, I will say this, though. You got to uh, – I saw you posted some – the toe tapper was back a little bit. doing oh, yeah. Swaying the hips a little bit. I mean, we, we got to see Man, some of that. And you know what, Patrick? He felt me coming a mile away. When he felt that groove and he saw my eye, he looked at me and says, are you rolling? Are you rolling? <laughs> As if to say, come on, baby, I'm yeah. ready. <laughs> He's always on. You know that. Oh, yeah. When the red light comes on, it's it's time to work. There's no doubt about that. I love it. Hey, they uh, broke the mold when they made oh, it. Oh, no doubt about that. Hey, let's uh, let's discuss the matchup you got b- before we get into some yep. bigger college football stuff. You got the noon broadcast uh, coming up with Nebraska and Purdue. You know, Nebraska's kind of been a little bit in the news here in the last week or two. Scott Frost is uh, talking about you know the 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 guys and and friends and enemies and everybody trying to get on the same page. I mean it. There's a lot of kind of kind of brewing with Nebraska right now. What's your read on what's going on with Scott Frost? Patrick, you know, it's really interesting. And I love doing these kind of games. I know the coaches don't really like to 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 engage us because, you know, we seem to be synonymous with all of the bad things that are going on, whether it's quarterback problems, both teams are dealing with those injuries as deep as three players. So that's an issue. But but I love to watch people manage crisis. Uh, I was just reading the other day about something broader than football, but it was talking about how the crisis doesn't really make you. It just merely exposes who you are. And then once you get a sense of what you are, then you begin the process of kind of rebuilding, or in this particular case, uh, Nebraska has never really been this place before. And, and it's tough, and it's new for the fan base to deal with. Scott, obviously, Scott Frost coming off a consensus coach of the year award in 2017, this is all new for him. And so winning a national championship here when he was playing quarterback, where they are right now as a program is new territory so he's dealing with things that he hadn't had to before um that the motions get frayed a little bit between players and coaches and there's a lot of apologizing been going on this last week but i love to be doing these games because it's fun to watch the coaches manage the crisis and we get a chance to get in there and talk to them about what's going on and get under the hood a little bit and then discover the leadership that's going to get them back to where they need to be so both coaches are facing some challenges Oh, uh, you know, it's it's just a tough one, but they've got to overcome. Yeah, you mentioned both coaches, Jeff Brom over at, at Purdue, who's I didn't I didn't even realize Spencer that USA Today came out with their their list of of coaches. I didn't realize he's he's like a, a what a four million dollar man, five million dollar. I mean, he's, that guy's making some serious bank. And you know, last year we we they were a, a good team, looked like they were kind of on the on the rise, and then they've struggled a bit this year. What have you seen from Purdue and, and you know, maybe some of the stresses that Brahm's under knowing that he's got that big contract he's trying to live up to? Well, Jack Plummer, his quarterback, is hurt. No relation to Jake Plummer. Uh, that's a big deal, and they've got a, a first-year guy that's behind him who came in in, in relief and didn't do particularly well also. So, you know, both sides, whether it's Adrian Cannell, his backup, or Jack Plummer, um, those quarterbacks have not performed up to the level that, you know, this coach is. He obviously comes from great lineage back in Louisville. His dad is an iconic coach as well. So he's expecting more from that quarterback position. And so I think overall their talent level is a little bit down. You're right that he did come in, kind of made a bit of a splash early on. But after that, it's been rather tepid. And he's making, as you said, big money for this conference. You know, they, they make a lot, but they also expect their coaches to perform at high levels. So if you're in that 3-7 to 5-2 range, you better be delivering at least 8 to 9 to 10 wins a year. Otherwise, you're going to be on the hottest of hot seats. And, and it's kind of where it's getting right now. That little honeymoon is about ready to end. So he's got to get his quarterback. This is the same narrative for both teams. Both of them are dealing with quarterback issues, and uh, that's what we see the challenge in this game pivoting on. Yeah, the good news is that's why I don't ever get paid anything, Spencer, because no one will expect <laughs> anything out of me if I don't get paid anything. Uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. <laughs> talking to Spencer <laughs> Tillman, uh, college football analyst for Fox all right, uh, Spencer T., part of the reason that I wanted to have you on at, at this juncture is uh, the NCAA Board of Governors has come out, and, and I keep telling everyone that they need to slow down for a, a bit because 
Uh, some of the stories, even some of the national stories, have made it out like, well, this is happening. It's going down immediately. Everybody's getting paid. Well, no. Mm-hmm. It's the Board of Governors has said we're going to look into it. We've told the the three levels, one, two, and three, Division one, two, and three, to figure out how to make this work. But you and I both know, Spencer, the NCAA is a leviathan. It doesn't move quickly. It doesn't turn quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm curious what, A, what you think the timetable might be on this because – they're going to come out with rules and regulations regarding this. We don't know what those may be, but we uh, we know that it probably won't be quick. What do you think might be the timetable for when the NCAA finally gets this done? Well, almost by default, the impetus and the, the default line would be, what, approximately three years or so, because that's when the litigation or the, the actual law that was written in California goes into play. And I think after that happens, uh, you've got this interim period of two and a half, roughly three years, be progressive, if you will, to do things that move you closer to what will be inevitable. This was going to happen at some point in time. I, I think the thing I tweeted about that's significant for me is what will the discourse be? What will the conversation be? Will there be this vitriol between the, the academics who are uh, dyed in the wool, um, you know, against the athlete moving to a level that's consistent with other aspects of life. But you can't name for me another aspect of life where people who are responsible for generating between seven and a half and eight billion dollars in formal television rights per annum do not participate. And again, I understand the whole notion of amateurism, but it's not really amateurism in the strictest sense. And then you start comparing the rules that are of the, that are that are against the guys that are in the revenue-generating sports. For example, if I happen to be an engineering student or a music student, I can go to a Starbucks, put my little bucket out there, and play music, and people can drop five, ten bucks or a saw buck in there, and then I can go home and nobody's even considering that. But if I am an athlete, a football player, and I do a camp, or a basketball player, and I do a camp, and I get remunerated just for my travel to get there, then I can be literally ruled and eligible. And depending on what type of player I am, I could affect the fortunes of the team. If I'm a star player on the team, that has real impact. And it's just one of those deals where it's needed to correct it for a long time. It was wrong since its inception. So now we've got to deal with it. But it's like anything else. Reinhold Niebuhr wrote in his book, Moral Man, Immoral Society, Privileged Groups Rarely Give Up or Share Privilege Without Great and Strong Resistance. And I think it's the academics who have to make the great adjustment here. But they've got a significant window. I think that was part of the, the rationale behind why uh, the lawmakers there and the governor of, of California really got behind this because it's saying, look, guys, we're not trying to shove anything down your throat. We want you to control your own institution. And it's about time you start governing in a way that's responsible and, more importantly, equitable. Absolutely. Spencer Tillman from uh, College Football on Fox. Uh, so they, they put a, a set of guidelines out when they released this, Spencer. And, and, and I think, by and large, the guidelines are good. Uh, you're not going to have or you're not supposed to have people inducing a kid to go to a certain school by saying we can give you this money from a you know local car dealership come sign at Alabama uh you, you sh- you're not supposed to have anyone trying to induce you to stay hey don't go to the draft mm-hmm. don't go somewhere else because we can get you this money here at Clemson or three don't inducing someone to transfer somewhere else uh hey come to Clemson because we can get you this money leave whatever school you're at i think those are good guidelines my question is I've got to imagine the ability to uh, govern this and the ability to to go in and try to police this has got to be amazing because, look, no one's going to put it in writing. Hey, if you say as a high school senior, if you sign with State U, we're going to get you a car dealer that'll pay you 20 grand. That's going to be someone's going to just tell you that. I I can't imagine that the policing of this is going to be very easy at all. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair statement, Patrick. And, and I think I kind of subscribe, and I don't think this is a panacea here. This is not the cure-all, but I think it is a way to approach this. Heretofore, it's been about rules, 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 rules. I like what Herm Edwards, the coach at Arizona State, uh, subscribes to. He says, I'm about standards. I'm not about rules. And once we set standards, that is, we have – points that we're trying to reach within our program that are respectable. We don't need rules to identify how to be nice to someone. We don't need rules to look at someone and decide whether or not that's an equitable and fair way of doing something. If someone commits and signs a national letter of intent, and then you're another institution trying to induce them after you know they're on record of having signed that, then that should be a violation of some sort. It doesn't need to be a rule. It needs to be a standard. And if programs are found to be be punitive, I mean, the, the violating those standards, I think the punitive damages should be significant in those cases because it is standards, ultimately. Uh, the bottom line is this. If you can 
try to get it down into degrees and, and levels, but it doesn't matter. If you violate the standard, you have to pay a significant price. And in a very real sense, I think that's kind of what SMU did, and that's why it took them nearly 35 years to get back to a point where they are. What they did was such a violation of what was standard at the time that it took them a long time to recover. Now, ultimately, one could argue that what happened at Penn State, and to a lesser, maybe a greater extent because of the nature of it and the recency of it and where we are in our culture, but what Matt Rule is dealing with at Baylor mm -hmm. is even more of a challenge. But look. Look where, where that program has come in such a relatively short period of time. It doesn't diminish the significance of the transgressions that took place under Art Brow. But what it is saying is that if you have someone in there that is morally sound, just doing the right thing, you should not hang that over over his head while he's turning that program around. Anybody that's there right now, there's not one coach on that staff that was responsible for those transgressions that took place then. But with SMU, I think there was kind of this lagging, this kind of lack of an acknowledgement of it and a kind of a hubris that kind of stood over it. So it took longer to recover. But I think you have to have standards. I think you're right on point. It's going to be tough to police. Listen, they were too small to police what they had before, yeah. Patrick. They couldn't police it. So it's a tough thing, but it's something that has to take place, and we've got to move forward. Uh, one thing I've heard uh, repeatedly from people who are, are somewhat anti uh, this idea of, of, of athletes being able to make money off of their own name, image, or likeness is the, the, the jealousy factor within the team. And as a guy who you've been on a lot of teams, you, you were on uh, one of the you know, great storied college programs of all time. You've been in the NFL where you know, the star quarterback's making uh, 10 times as much as, as the running back is, whatever. Do you think that this will be an issue if – let's say a Johnny Manziel goes out and he's getting, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year for autographs or whatever, uh, do you think then the, the right tackle becomes jealous and says, well, I'm not blocking for this guy. Look at the money he's making. I think it gets, this comes back to your notion of standards. The head coach can set a climate or, 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 or a temperament among the players where he essentially says, look, guys, you're the quarterback. Um, you referred to me playing with the San Francisco 49ers. I remember that second Super Bowl I got a contract with Champion at the time because we were part of some great things that were taking place. My contract wasn't the same as Joe Montana's or Ronnie Lott. It was because I was a third down specialist, special teams guy, and I was going to get X amount of time on that field. I understood that. I'm rational. I'm sane. I get it. And I think players understand the same thing at the collegiate level. Listen, I was just a few years removed from the college ranks, and I think anybody who's playing at the National Football League isn't so far removed I mean, let's, let's, you know, the mean uh, age is around 23.9. So when you start looking at things like that, not a whole lot of maturity takes place between 21 and 23.9. Uh, There's not a lot of difference there. I think these guys are smart enough, reasonable enough, and rational enough to know that if I'm not a frontline player, then I'm probably not getting remunerated. But I think before you even get to that point, Patrick, the coach has to be willing to set a climate and a temperament where you don't flaunt the fact that you've made more money than someone else. How you promote that within your organization is up to the coaches. And if they are leaders and they know how to manage, they can create a culture that respects that, that no one wants to be flaunting uh, your, your value in the face of people who aren't making as much. That's not a high standard to set. That's not a fair standard. That's not a, stand, that's not a winning standard. So, again, I think that falls on the shoulders of the coaches. Many of them making 4 and $5 million a year. Uh, that's the least that they should be able to navigate through. Spencer Tillman from Fox Sports joining us. I, Spence, I look back at uh, at your college last year. I mean, the highest paid guy on that team was Kyler Murray uh, after he had that <laughs> Oakland A's contract. He was making more than, than Lincoln Riley was. At that Absolutely. Point. So, and, and it didn't seem like there was jealousy. It. Nobody said a word about it. In fact, he went on to win the Heisman Trophy. So, what you know, when you start thinking about what these guys are capable of doing, now one would make the argument, hey, look, that was in another sport. It was baseball. It didn't have anything to do with that. But I have to believe that if, in fact, a guy was able to put up those stats and a tenable argument to me in, in a rational way, that what he does, let's say, is more important in terms of just looking at it literally. I mean, listen, what Tom Brady does for the Patriots, what uh, – um, Deshaun Watson does for the, the Houston Texans, it's more than what the average placement. What J.J. Watt does, it's more. That's why they make more. So I don't know why we wrestle with that and we try to shoehorn us, everybody into this notion of fair and equitable because it's not fair and equitable, and we all know that. It's this kind of farce of amateurism that we've tried to create that doesn't exist. It's, that's the great offense in all of this, and it's been the, one of the biggest ruses 
in all of college sports. It's how we somehow think that everybody is equal in terms of their performance and what they contribute to the team. There's something to be said for teamwork. But the bottom line is the quarterback position by default is going to be worth more, even on average team. Yeah, absolutely. Final question for me, Spencer, uh, uh, just kind of uh, back, uh, you know, a 30,000 foot view of college football as we, we, we head into the stretch run. What are you what storylines are you most interested in keeping up with as we ha- hit the stretch run? Well, listen, I'm you know, Tim talks about the have nots all the time. We haven't talked about them in those that language recently, but it used to be the BCS world in Christ. I'm wondering if. Baylor has enough cachet. Can they upset Oklahoma? Can they go get to them at 9-0 and and be undefeated? What Then what happens in that scenario? We start looking at teams like what Sonny Dykes is doing at SMU. Uh, do they have a strong enough cachet to make a dent? Probably not. We all feel that. But I think you, what it's going to do is exacerbate this discussion about who the undefeateds are, how much value do they really have, and then maybe another narrative of, of that related to that, Patrick, would be like the Oklahomas. Is there enough strength within that conference with a weaker than normal Texas to prop them up if they have a if they stumble like they did last week? Everybody gets a mulligan. You can make that argument, but when you start really breaking down the teams that are worthy, does Oklahoma have enough with beating the Texas or maybe an Oklahoma State or an, an, an Iowa State in the years that they are up or whatever it is? Is it still going to be enough to be sitting there with one loss and be left out or still get in? We know it's not an issue for the SEC because if you're in the SEC West in particular, you can have a loss. But if you navigate that West and wind up playing in the championship game, it's happened before and it will likely happen again. So these teams that are in conferences like the Big 12, they better start understanding what impact it will have on them moving forward. Oklahoma learned this lesson a couple of years ago, but it's going to come to the fore even more in years when you have weaker teams that have historical profiles like Texas. And that can be a problem for them moving forward. I predict there's going to be fissures within that conference sooner or later. I'm not saying it's going to be succeeding from the union, as it were, but there's going to be some serious discussion about it because it's hurting the conference. Yeah, no doubt about that. Spencer T., you're the best, my friend. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, by the way, I just realized you and Rogers Hampton are the exact same age. You look like you're 35. Rogers looks like he's 85. So you're, whatever you're doing, keep living right, my friend. <laughs> Ah, thank you, brother. Take care, man. All right, Spencer T. from uh, College Football on Fox. Man, he is telling you he's the smartest guy in the room. He is really, really good. Man, I love Spencer. And just a good dude, too. I I, oh, I have a big man crush on Spencer Tillman. I'm not going to lie. I like that dude.